Hello, I'm Simon Christie and welcome to your favourite four-wheel drive TV. We've got a great episode planned, so let's get stuck straight into it. Tread lightly, keep it safe, play hard. G'day guys, Max here again and welcome to the Sunday morning of the 2014 Slattery Auctions Condo 750. We've got a big day of racing ahead of us, the cars have swapped over onto the motorbike track and the motorbikes are chasing up where the cars were yesterday, so it'll be, it'll be interesting, the bikes are following in the ruts, the cars are following a bit of a track, so it uh, changes the way the race goes, the, the cars get a bit quicker and the bikes get a bit slower. The weather has been fantastic. It was rainy all week until Friday morning. The sun's out, it's warm, it's dust, there's plenty of dust. It's always dust at Condo. This morning we were out northeast of Condoblin for the first stage. It, uh, it's a bit more hilly, rocky, gravel country. It's certainly different to the northwest where it's more open, red loam running and much quicker out here. The first section that we got into there today. We, we took the camera crew down to Dead Man's Gully and got some awesome hill climb shots and I'm sure you guys will love it. Today's racing has been quite interesting. The lead vehicle blew his gearbox not far into the second stage. It's a big disappointment for them. And the top three cars are chasing each other and they're changing around. No one can guess. This, this will be a, a fight to the finish. We've had one unfortunate situation but it just highlights how important the safety here is in these events. It saves lives. A little bit of excitement for you? Oh yeah, just a little bit. We come through a single portion, through a dip, and there was a hump after it. We hit the hump and it kicked the back up. And then after that, the nose is dug into the ground and she just went for six. I think it did a full pike in the air and landed on my corner. It's caged the cage down to the dashboard on my side. It's bent just about all the cage and, yeah, she's a complete loss. The navigator's gone for observation into hospital and broke his helmet. You both came out of it all right, though? Uh, oh, yeah, I'm all right. I, you know, just another day in the office. Very, very disappointing, but for the viewers at home, it just shows how critical it is to have these safety equipment in these vehicles. Oh, definitely. You know, our helmets are sort of... Twelve to fifteen hundred dollars worth, and you wouldn't even even skimp. Here's his helmet. As you can see, she's had a fairly good hit there. That's it. That's the that's the day over, I think. Unless you got some polish.
handheld UHF versus an in-car UHF. I guess the first thing we need to understand with UHFs is they do come in different output capacities. Typically, nearly every car mounted UHF other than commercial ones will be five watts. Most handheld UHFs are like half a watt, one watt, two watt, three watts, but you can get five watt UHFs. So the question would therefore be, if I've got a five watt handheld and I've got a five watt in my car, what's the difference? The answer is really simple, guys. It's the thing out the front, the stick, it's the antenna. A bigger, better high gain antenna will give you better performance. It will give you better ears for listening and better distance for speaking. So you're gonna work better in every application. The other big thing with a car mounted unit is you don't leave it behind. <laughs> it's in the car all the time. You don't have to worry about picking it up or charging it or anything else with it. Now there's only one problem, I guess, with a car mounted unit you do have to think about. If you've got to jump out of the car to give instructions or directions, you can't take it with you, okay? In my opinion, if you can afford to buy two, you have one of each. But if you're only going to choose one UHF, you've got to think about what your application is going to be. If it's typically four wheel driving, and I guess as you're in your car all the time, the good thing about the car mounted unit, as I said, you're never going to forget it. It doesn't need batteries charging. You can listen to different channels. You can have it scanning between, for instance, the trucky channel and your private channel you're listening on. So I would probably send to say car mounted UHF. They start from as little as a couple of hundred dollars. So they're not a lot more money. And you're getting your full five watt capacity. I think it's a great way to go. Okay, so how to wire your air compressor depends a little bit on the sort of compressor that you have. A high amperage compressor, like the ARB Twin Compressor for example, draws quite high amps, up to 50 amps at times. So in this instance, the best option would certainly be to wire the compressor to the main battery and have the engine running when you're using it. With a portable compressor or a smaller hardwired compressor, you do have the option of wiring it to the main battery or the auxiliary battery. The benefit of wiring any compressor to the main battery is that you get a higher voltage to that compressor and compressors run far more efficiently at a higher voltage. From the alternator, you can have 14.2 volts running to your compressor. With a battery at rest, like an auxiliary battery, it's gonna be more like 12.5 volts. And whilst that doesn't sound like a lot of difference, when you're inflating four tires, particularly off-road tires, which tend to be a bit larger, that difference is quite a bit when it comes to time. We've really noticed the tracks drying out as we've moved through the Sunday. It's incredibly dusty in some sections, starting to chop up a bit and creating some big slides on corners. It's also making it hard for the cars chasing each other. They've got to fight with the dust. And whilst they've got well-cut tracks to follow, the navigation must come in in the dust, otherwise you will get lost. It's, it's very easy in the dust to make a wrong turn and end up somewhere you have no idea where you are. Gates have also been an interesting part of today. Teams have been having a bit of trouble with them. They're trickier, I guess. But the most interesting thing is when they're chasing each other into a gate. There's, there's one team comes in and just gets through and locks the gate on the, the one behind. It's all fair racing out here. Over the weekend, it's split into three stages each day. Three for the cars, three for the bikes, with the transit stage between them. There was quite a distance between stage one this morning and stage two but everyone made it there and got into the racing. It was quite interesting. And beginning of stage two, it was a great open, fast track with plenty of dust. So out of the total 1,000 kilometres for the two days, we've got about 500 k's each day, a north track and a west track. The motorbikes did the north track on the Saturday with the cars doing the west. They would switched today. The cars are doing the north track and the bikes on the west. So over the two days, the vehicles will cover 1,000 kilometres with only 750 kilometres of competitive and the transit stages being the remainder. Hence the name, the Slattery Auctions Condo 750. Each year we try and have a, an even split of the kilometres over each day with about 500 on the first and 500 on the second day. So it's a fair effort for the teams to not only plan out their route and their spares, but they've got to really manage their fuel. They can't fuel up except in the designated fueling areas. So if you run short, you run short and you're in the middle of nowhere. 
with only one stage left to go today, it's going to be go, 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 and it'll be really down to the wire. The teams will be pushing harder than ever before, with the top three positions still wide open. Daniel, a huge weekend of racing. How much planning goes into this event? Oh, a huge amount of planning. There's a team of committee members that work on this event for a whole 12 months, and they do a great and wonderful job of actually putting it together. There's obviously the guys who take care of sponsorship, the guys who take care of the track setting, and there's a heap that I will forget, but a huge amount of time is spent just organising the track and organising the sponsors, taking care of the CAMS licensing and the Motorcycles New South Wales licensing. There's just a huge team of people who put a great amount of effort into an event like this. And it's all basically volunteers? You know, the volunteers are a huge part of the event. For right from the heart of the event to organising it throughout the year to the people who show up on weekends and take care of controls and take care of recoveries and track down bikes and cars and even the paramedics and the guys who go around and escort the media. Volunteers just are the people who are heart and soul of this event. They just make it happen. Now, access for four-wheel driving and access for races is a big concern right across Australia, so we're very, very fortunate to have 51 landowners this year who have put their properties up. We are, we are. Those guys just go out of their way completely to help this event take place. They let us go in and tear up their country and absolutely make a mess of everything, and they just cooperate so well with regards to getting stock and fences and the availability of gates being opened, and those guys are just put in an immense amount of effort into having their properties prepared and well and truly ready for us to race on for the whole duration of the weekend. Now I know that events like this cannot run without the generous support of sponsors. Who are the major people you'd like to thank this year please? Our major sponsors this year are Slattery's Auctions. They've been supporting us for many years. They do a great job. They come down, they're escorted around. They're just great supporters of the event. We'd like to thank them so much for everything that they do and contribute. Other than Slattery's Auctions, we have Honda. We have the Railway Hotel Motel Condoblin. We have Rock 95.5. We have Grunt Global. We have 2PK. We have Coats Hire in Parks. Woodstock Bourbon. Four Wheel Drive TV. The Australasian Safari. Broad Hay and Spray, we have the Shaman's IGA and Liquor Store, we have the Lachlan Shire Council, North Parks Mines, CMOC, the Shell Service Station, PJL, Imparja, Lachlan Ready Mix, the Wind Network, Dirt Comp Magazine, Oils Plus, Cooler Ice, Cooper's Tyres, Pertec and Extra Mile Motorcycles. And I would like to say a huge thank you to those guys for all their contribution into the event. Now, Daniel, in the auto class, who were the overall winners, please? Uh, overall this year for 2014 Condo 750 in third place, we have Terry Penson and Richard DeBrink in their Falcon RTV. In second place, we have Michael Denham and Ross Arico in their Evo Bajero. And in first place, the outright winner for this year's Condo 750 was Tom Dixon and Nick Peters in their patrol. I'd just like to thank all the competitors and to congratulate all our competitors for this year. I'd just like to say a huge thanks to Four Wheel Drive TV. This is the first time they've been back in about five years and we really hope to see them next year. We've had Simon, Miranda and Liam here hanging out with us this weekend and it's been a great time. Now, Daniel, Condoblin is a very remote town here in central New South Wales. This is a big injection for the local community, isn't it? It's a huge injection for the local community. The service crews included with their competitors obviously make a huge contribution to the local economy, whether it be fuel, food, accommodation, huge benefit to our town. And it really, really does unify the community. I mean, people to get together and come together and put on an event like this. For a lot of the residents of the town, it's an event they look forward to all year. For more information on this event, go to condo750.com.au. I'm on the road from Terrain Tamer. A lot of people ask me uh, as they're heading off on a trip somewhere what the basic things they would take. 
great air to hose kits. They're available for all models. It's in a handy sort of dustproof pack that you can uh, keep it in, even in, if you want to change it and put your old ones in here, perhaps to help somebody else down the track. Heater hose kits, very handy because they've got some twisted looking funny hoses which different shapes and ends which you mightn't be able to get out in the bush. Handy to have, not very dear, and all for your model, still in a dustproof pack. Filter kit, I think that's pretty important because you never know when you get a stone through a filter or you, or you need to blow out your air filter because you've been following somebody a bit too close. By the time you buy the, the kit, it's almost cheaper than, certainly cheaper than buying all the individual parts. Got a fan belt kit, that's handy to have. Vital to have, not just handy, it's vital to have. We're out in the bush, they're only a small size, pretty cheap. I'd take a wheel bearing kit. They do interchange front and back in a lot of models. They're Koyo bearings, the best you can buy, and especially the in OK seals. You could take shock absorbers front and back if you're heading a fair distance. Probably not a bad idea because people come back to me and they say, hey, the biggest problem we had was with shock absorbers they, because they've been stone damaged or they've been caught up somewhere. So probably a pair of shock absorbers. I'm Alan Gray from Train Taylor. See you down the track. Hi, my name's Darren Pearce. I'm from the Sutherland Shire in Sydney, and I've got a 12007 Parado. I've got the bar lifted at two inches, tyres on it. Got a few light bars, as you can see. A fridge in the back, fitted the whole back out. We go out camping a fair bit with it. Roof rack, dual battery system with the Red Arc system on it. Uh, we've got rock sliders, breathers on the gearboxes and diff. It's got a bonnet scoop there as well, LED lights. And I'm running HIDs in the headlights and HIDs in the two front spotties from a distance where the LEDs throw out the wide beam for me when we're driving at night. We head down the south coast of New South Wales a fair bit and over Christmas times and we do a lot of runs during the year. The Wadigans, we go to Lithgow a fair bit out the back at Sunny Corner and places like that. I'd love to do the Simpsons Desert Crossing pretty soon. I'm trying to gear up for that at the moment. For information on the Your Rig Trips and how to enter, please keep an eye for updates on the 4 Drive TV Facebook page. Each weekly winner takes home a Mean Mother Recovery Strap Drying Bag, a Mean Mother Stubby Holder, a Mean Mother Mug and a Mean Mother Umbrella, a Nava Pocket LED Light and Nava Stubby Holder, an Electric Blue Span Set Recovery Strap, a complete Mickey Thompson Tire Cleaning Kit, a bottle of the Australian designed Diesel Additive from Responsive Engineering, a bottle of Bundaberg Ginger Beer, a U-Fix-It windscreen repair kit, a Manel Motors stubby holder, a pair of expander pegs, an easy to carry litre of gear oil thanks to 360 gearboxes and diffs, a pair of four-wheel drive TV stickers, a copy of Wild Deer and Hunting Adventures magazine, an emergency ration of sanitarium up and go, a complete UHF radio tradies value pack thanks to Oricom UHF, a Berrima diesel, ARB or superior engineering cap, an ARB t-shirt, an ARB travel mug, an ARB jacket, and it's all neatly wrapped up in an ARB cargo gear carry bag. I'd just like to say thank you to Four Wheel Drive TV, to Simon and Miranda, and thank you to all the sponsors for all the prizes. G'day, I'm Tim from Oricom. Today I'm going to talk about UHF communication and why it's so important. UHF communication is a brilliant means of communication from vehicle to vehicle, person to person, 
whether you're on the road and whether you're on the track, it's a great way to find out what the, the track is like, what the roads are like, what obstacles you're, you're coming up against. And it's a generally a good way to stay in touch just as you're travelling together. UHF is also a fantastic means of, of using guidance. You've got your in-vehicle unit, you've also got your handheld unit, so you can have someone out there guiding you through a track, through those treacherous areas, to make sure you stay safe. UHF communication, a clean, crisp, reliable means of communication, vehicle to vehicle, handheld to vehicle, they all work together perfectly. One of the big benefits of UHF communication is it's a relatively low cost means of communicating. Once you actually buy the unit, you've got free communication. You can talk generally to the horizon, so as far as you can see, you can talk. And it's a nice, clean, crisp, reliable means of communication. Copy, Alan. You can just slow down for a second. We're going to get uh, set up. I'm assuming we're turning right towards Scotts Reserve, back towards the main road. Yes, go towards Woods Point, yes. No worries, just at that corner, we've uh, got a camera position. There's no ongoing costs. Once you get the unit installed, you've got good, clean, reliable communication. And now with the expansion to 80 channels, you generally find that there's always going to be a free, clear channel for you and your, your mates to communicate on. If you're finding that you're getting a lot of conversation or a lot of overlap on one channel, you can always switch up. So generally you've got from channel 1 to channel 80 to communicate on. You'll always be able to find a clear, crisp channel to have that conversation. Can you, can you please pick up Hamish just at that corner? I'm Tim from Oricom. Thanks for watching 4 Wheel Drive TV. I'm Warren Denham, this is my race vehicle which is a Triton Ute we built to do Condo and the Australian Safari and any other cross country rally that comes around. We are having a good run today, we probably were 10-15 seconds off the lead when the transfer case failed on it today and we parked it 40k from the end of the event which was rather disappointing after all the effort we put in. Runs a 3000 GT motor, it's got 380 horsepower at the wheels. Current model Pajero front and rear cradle in the car, sequential gearbox, it's all space frame, nice and strong, easy to service. A few years of development have gone into it now and it's normally very reliable so I'm quite surprised on the failure. Hopefully we can nut out what caused it and stop it for future problems. 2007 was the first safari that it done, it took us probably 18 months to build it and it's uh, just a fantastic car to drive, nice and reliable, strong, uh, very capable. Probably needs a better driver because apparently I'm not. With the current sequential gearbox in it, it's been geared so it'll only do 185. You don't really do that much of the really high speed and this way we get to top speed real often. You do the 180 most of the day very, very fast. Hopefully the Silver City 1000 is on again this year. We'll definitely be there if it's on. And then we'll tend to go over and run Safari again this year in WA. I really need to thank Aaron for all the help that he's given me in preparation. Aaron navigates for me. My very understanding wife that puts up with me working on the car any chance I get. And if it wasn't for Transvent being there to help me out, I wouldn't be able to pay for it all, so it worked out well for us. Well viewers, thank you for tuning in for another big week of 4 Drive TV. We've got plenty of more 4 Drive action coming your way next week, don't miss it. I'm Simon Christie, tread lightly, keep it safe, play hard, I'll see you next week.